My name is Kamara Lundestad Truf, and I am a Norwegian Gambian. Uh, my father is from Gambia in the west coast of Africa, and my mother is from Mosjøen in the north of Norway. I was born in north of Norway uh, with my brother and my sister, and then my grandparents moved down south. Uh, so I was raised in the south of Norway, or in the middle of Norway. It's a long country. Uh, I grew up with a single mom, and my father was in prison. And I grew up with my two siblings. And then when my father got out, he remarried. My mother remarried. So we're seven siblings uh, hanging out together uh, on the west coast of Norway my entire childhood. I guess that's quite... I don't know if that's the definition of my upbringing, but we're a, quite a tight, close family traveling back and forth from the south to the north. Yeah. Uh, and I think I grew up in two quite different homes. I grew up with a, a Muslim father, a conservative father, but also a criminal father who was in and out of prison. And I grew up with a working class mother who's a shaman and made some very unconservative life choices in that aspect. So I think that like every other week I was living in two very different cultures and two very different homes, but both of them very much Norwegian. How did your parents meet? At a bar in Oslo. Yeah. My dad was wearing an orange jumpsuit. He was living in Brussels at the time, but he was visiting Oslo. And he was wearing an orange jumpsuit and he was being picked up by a queer couple. And as a very conservative, uh, but very flashy uh, Muslim man, he was freaking out. So my mom came over and saved him, cussed him out for not behaving properly and being slightly homophobic and nervous, but also saved him and extracted him from the situation. And I guess that's how they met. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, so let's talk about, tell me about some of the, the traditions that your family maintained growing up um, in reference to the Nordic culture. What are, what are some of those traditions? What did that look like? Well, I think that uh, Norway is quite a secular country, so our traditions are more cultural than they are religious, but we do maintain, uh, uh, we're very into Christmas, of course, but not the American Christmas, the Norwegian Christmas, which as we understand, at least from like watching Home Alone, which is basically our Christmas reference to American Christmas in Norway, um, a little more downplayed, but uh, I guess it's the um, the notion of Christmas is of course like the three days of Christmas that you have. You have the small Christmas Eve and you have Christmas Eve and you have the first day of Christmas and you wear your fancy clothes for two hours on Christmas Eve and other than that you're just in pajamas walking around together playing board games and sitting behind like in front of the fire eating turkey or pork or a fish or everything that smells bad but tastes good. Uh, and I guess that's like, if I think about Norwegian tradition, Nordic traditions that we're part of, I think that is one of the few things that we maintain in my family. And then everything else is just, I don't know, right now in Norway it's Easter. And Easter is a huge thing in Norway. It's not such a big thing in the States, but nobody celebrates Easter because of Jesus Christ. We celebrate it because it means you can go to the cabin or you have like mandatory days off. So it's a week off. So I guess we are very into holidays without being very loyal to the reason why it's a holiday. Yeah, I guess that's the Norwegian traditions that I've been part of, yeah. What are some of the values that were emphasized by, by your parents, your family members, your ancestors? What are some of those values that you feel were really emphasized growing up? I think values is a, it's a, um, We talk a lot about like Norwegian values. Uh, we have this, I don't know, this kind of like Scandinavian exceptionalism where we think that all good values come from Scandinavia and we, we have the Nobel Peace Prize and we made it first. And then of course those values are always changing with the political climate and with, uh, uh, with the times. Uh, I think that of course I grew up with values of equality, uh, of uh, 
of the importance of criticizing structures and power and norms. Uh, I'm a queer woman, so I also grew up with very understanding parents regarding to uh, how how the world is built together. And Norway is seen as a very, very a positive country for LGBTQ uh, people to reside in. But it's 2022 now, so this year it's the 50th anniversary of decriminalization of uh, queer people in Norway. But we see queer rights as one of our main values. But that it's, it's such a short amount of time to talk about something to be inherently ours or inherently a family's values or a country's values. But I think that a Norwegian value that I grew up with at least was, um, was to try to adapt and take in the rest of the world. It was quite uncommon for my mother to marry my father in the 80s if north of Norway. Uh, so, of course, my family saw multiculturalism as a huge part of our family values, but it would take years before that were part of Norwegian values in that sense. We don't really use the word values in Norway, like vadir, norske vadir. When we talk about values mm -hmm. in that sense, like to say that's a vadi, mm -hmm. then it's, it has very right-wing connotations. Oh. Yeah, so when we talk about like Norwegian values, everybody's like, oh no, 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 because it's, it's so right-wing connotations okay, regarding it, to it. It, The it. only one who talks about Norwegian values are like uh, the Progress Party, Fremskrits Party, and they do it wearing the bunad and eating like and telling like it's important for people to assimilate to Norwegian values. So to to just to taste like, okay, what does value mean like in an American context and then in like a Norwegian context. But I think that uh, my grandparents and my mother's values and my father's values from coming from uh, West Africa, because there are a lot of like commonalities when it comes to even though Norway is a very secular country, there are these we are very into the humanities. And uh, the, the values of, uh, of solidarity, I think, is something that I was like, very imprint, imprinted on from, from I was a child, which was very important for my uh, grandparents and their political awakening and being part of the working class and the solidarity of the working class, uh, which was also important to my father as an immigrant to have like class perspectives and intersectional perspectives and how people navigate their bodies within the structures of Norway. So I think that one of the, the biggest like family values and I think Nordic values that I have taken with me in my life is the importance of standing up for people who are less fortunate than you, but also always doing it while criticizing the structure that makes people at it, puts people at a disadvantage. So I think that like structural politics as a family value, maybe, yeah. Great, so let's talk about this. What does it mean to be Nordic? Oh, I have no idea what it means to be Nordic. I've been trying to figure that out for my entire 34 years of life. I think there's a lot of conceptions around what it is to be Nordic. I think there's a lot of Nordic or Scandinavian exceptionalism. I have lived and worked both in, I'm fluent in Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish. So I have lived in all of Scandinavia and I've worked in Finland and in Iceland for several years. So I do know the Nordic region very, very well and I've done a lot of documentaries about what it means to be Nordic. But I, uh, I don't know. I really don't know what it means to be Nordic. These earrings that I'm wearing, they're from a Sami mine. You know, all of north of Norway and the northern region is on occupied Sami territory from our indigenous people. And I worked a lot up in Finnmark with, uh, with decolonization. And if you ask the northern population what it means to be Nordic, they will have a very different answer than the south. And I was raised both in the north and in the south. But I think that, um, I think to be Nordic these days means to be privileged, but aware of it. I think it means, um, God, I have no idea what it means to be Nordic, but I think it means, um, to me at least, being Nordic, uh, 
means being safe, uh, safe but curious. I guess that's super Nordic to be safe but curious, to have the uh, privilege of being able to taking risks, to have access to social mobility, uh, to be able to travel and see the world and be curious about the world because you can always go home and be taken care of. I think that is a very like Nordic that means that uh, the residents, the citizens of the Nordic region have the, have, have the opportunities to live very fulfilled lives because of the social democratic uh, structure that surrounds us and the oil. And uh, I think to be Nordic is to be aware of that and a tiny bit ashamed of it, but very grateful. Let's talk about sustainability. Mm. What does sustainability mean for you and your culture? How does that resonate with you, sustainability? You know, in the, the one of the most amazing things about the Nordic region or the north or Norway in particular is the access to nature, the access to nature resources. Even though we are uh, like globally famous for our resources pertaining to oil, we have so much waterfalls, we have so much currents, we have so much fish. God, we have so much fish, so much fish. The salmon, the, the, the cod, the, and I think that that's one of the, one of the most important things uh, as a Norwegian uh, and that you learn from very small, when you're small of age, is to protect the environment because we are completely dependable on uh, coexisting with it. Also because our environment is so harsh, the winters are so cold, you need to know how to. Uh, to move through a Scandinavian winter uh, and to move through a mountain and to move through a forest and what happens if you get lost and everybody's skiing. And I think that sustainability, especially when it comes to uh, an environmental point of view, is something that is truly like indoctrinated within you since you are like in kindergarten. You, you, you learn about it, you talk about it, what kind of value, and that's I think is a core the read, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a core Norwegian value, but it's uh, it's a core part of our identity to identify with our nature resources and the wealth that we have around us. And I think from a social democratic point of view, which is also one of our uh, the pillars of the Scandinavian, the Nordic society, it has been to even though we have access to a lot of resources, you're not allowed to spend them. We have something called handlingsregel, which just means that it's the rule of uh, rule of action. Which means that whatever the government makes, they're only allowed to spend 04 percent of the interest because everything else for the next generation. So everything everything that you attain is put aside for the next generation, and that kind of generational sustainability has been part of the Nordic core values long before we found the oil. And I think that is one of the, the things that actually works very well in Scandinavia and in the Nordic region. So sustainability, both as social mobility, but also as environmental responsibility is something that we, um, that we grow up with. <sighs> I do hope that I don't think sustainability is universal even in Norway. I think that it's something that we should strive for universally to, uh, to understand that sustainability is of course also just a, a continuous work in progress. There is no end date on sustainability. But I do think that the more globalized the world becomes, uh, the shorter amount of space between our borders, how easy it is to visit each other to understand that we're all part of an ecosystem. It's one of the actions we can take that it's not necessarily this, this immediate award. Uh, a lot of effort and work that we put into as the human race, we would like to see immediate results for ourselves. Uh, and sustainability is about protecting something that is bigger than ourselves. It's about investing in something that is further away from ourselves. It's about taking responsibility for something that will happen in 200 years and that you will not see or reap the benefits of, but doing it 
despite of that or because of that. And I think that that act of consciousness uh, should be uh, a universal, there should be a universal incentive and sh it should be a universal value. It, it might not be, but, but it definitely should. Okay, let's talk about social justice. Mm -hmm. How does social justice resonate with you and the Nordic culture? I think, unfortunately, the word, so, the word social justice is something that is, in the Nordic region, labeled as something so utterly American that we would never identify with it, even though we are a, a country with a lot of political activism, a lot of activism for the climate, for uh, civil rights. I think that the world so social justice has also been the, like the social justice warriors on the internet that it has become, it's something that we don't identify with even though it is the same core value or the same, it being concerned with social justice is something that we, of course, are in Norway, but we would not use that term because it would be so American. And every time we have a political discussion in Norway, it's taken a long time to be able to talk about racism in Norway. I have worked with this for my entire adult career. And to try to find a language that is Norwegian to talk about racism in Norway, which is a huge problem, uh, to talk about it without it being dismissed as American is a huge challenge for everybody who works with social justice in Norway. So there has been a lot of work done in trying to distance ourselves from the American vocabulary so that we can insist that it's not an imported problem, it's not a culture war happening somewhere else, it's not us trying to uh, piggyback ride like the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, but to talk about social issues within a Nordic context pertaining to racism in particular has been a huge challenge for the political environments. So I don't think anyone would ever take the word social justice into their mouth when they're talking about equal rights in Norway. But it still, mean, it, that doesn't mean that the fight is not the same or that the struggles and the solutions and um, the politics surrounding it isn't the same, but words have so much power and there's so much education to be done, like you have to be a pedagogue to work with social justice in Norway and part of that pedagogy is to never use the word social justice, I guess. Um, talk to me about innovation in your life and how innovation as a value or not as a value, but how does innovation resonate with you? Oh. I'm sorry, I'm so bad at these, uh, these words. Innovation is just, I don't know, capitalism, I guess. When I hear the word innovation, I just think capitalism. Like this like exponential growth and how you're like tweaking the growth to be more, um, to be more, um, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, to have the growth to be more... Um, commercial? Commercial, yeah, and to have it more cutting edge, digital, uh, new horizons, like it's like, uh, so, um, so innovation, innovation, and it's a very, it's also a very right-wing word in Norway, it's uh, like, it's a very conservative word, so we, uh, you, when, uh, when we had like a, a, a blue right government for the past like eight years, and they started all of this, like instead of having the arts and culture sector, it was the innovation sector. Like they moved every word, removed every word that pertained to art and replaced it with innovation. So innovation is like a trigger word for people in the art sector in Norway, it's like innovation Norway. We're like, no, no innovation, no. So I think, <laughs> so it's, as, but as a value, uh, I don't. <laughs> or how about, this? how about, how do you feel like, um, you know, Encouraging creativity, uh, being resourceful, new ways of thinking. How about on that line of things? As, yeah. As relating to that, how does that resonate to you? People, you know, encouraging to be creative, new ways of thinking, new ways of kind of doing things. How how does that the idea of that resonate with you? Love it. Uh, I think that I uh, innovation is of course progress, like the notion of the wanting the longing for progress, for 
tiny, tiny, tiny steps forward every day, all the time. And then I think as an artist, I work uh, trying to um, trying to come at peace with understanding that um, that all movement that is happening in our society and globally and also within the Nordic region has to be these tiny steps moving us forward, put, moving us closer together, but just longing for, you know, revolution instead. You want to just take everything up with the root and turn it around to be impatient. Uh, I think one of my biggest fears as I'm go getting older and are moving into more positions of power, that I'm getting too patient, too patient with change, too patient with innovation, too patient with... Um, with progress. Uh, yeah, too patient with progress. Uh, so I do, I can never decide for myself if I want, if I want sustainable change, if I want uh, practical change, or if I just want like a revolution that burns everything down and then we have to start and rebuild from scratch, uh, which is a very privileged, uh, privileged thought experiment to be able to have when you're in within a position where you can actually contempl contemplate uh, which way you want things to change and how you want things to change. I think that in regions, there's this cliche uh, surrounding um, Scandinavian behavior or Nordic behavior. You have all these memes, all these pictures of 10 fins standing 20 meters apart at the bus stop. You would never talk to anybody on the bus. You would never talk to a stranger. The small talk, like the, the notion of coming as an immigrant to Norway uh, can feel like an extremely lonely experience. It's, very, it's a very closed off country. Uh, it's, a, it's a small place in that sense. We're five million people. So 90% of the people you know, you've known your entire life and you have the amount of people that you need. So it takes a lot of effort to let in new people within your social circles or within your families. And that is like the stereotype of Norway and it's the cliche of Norway. And in many ways it's true, but I do think that there is this notion of, of Norway wanting to be a refuge, wanting to be a place that is accessible and open to the world. And I think we've been working on this image for like 45 years, just trying to figure out how can we be these people when it's so uncomfortable for us to talk to strangers. But I, what I love about the Nordic region is even though we hate talking to strangers, we hate being open, we strive, we strive and we strive to be it. And I know watching my father uh, adapt to the Nordic countries and the Nordic culture, coming from West Africa, where everyone talks to everyone and every stranger is a new friend and everything is this kind of like loud, uh, loud-mouthed um, greeting to whatever, whenever. There is never a bad time. You don't call ahead. You just show up at the door. There's always extra food. There's always extra room to come to a country where there are so many social etiquettes to be adjusted to. But to also come to a country that really, really wants to change, wants to be open. We want it to be our core value. We're not open, but we really want to. And I think there's something lovely about that. And there's something um, very innocent about it maybe in a way, but also calculated that we are aware that we're not open, but we use it as an image that we wanna be open and we keep striving towards openness. But I do think that like Norway, what is a Nordic value? My father has lived in Norway for 40 years now and he is very much Norwegian and a Gambian at the same time. And he lives in a small city and he's open to everyone. And that means that that city is open. And now because my father is Norwegian and Gambian now and he's open, it becomes Norwegian. So I think with migration and the, the changes of the Norwegian society all the time now, I think that all global universal core values are becoming us because people from the entire, from all over the world are living in Norway and insisting on living their lives how, how it feels right to them. 
So I think migration has made Norway more open. And even though Norwegians strive to be inclusive, to be open, to be grateful, I don't know if that's a word, but grateful, I'll say it, grateful, grateful. Uh, I do think that that change has already happened because a Norwegian doesn't look like people assume a Norwegian should look like anymore. Norway is not what people assume Norway is because the entire world has moved into Norway. So openness is definitely our value. We just don't know how to identify with it. But we've wanted it for a long time, so. Yeah. I think the notion of the, the Nordic region, the, the Scandinavian exceptionalism, the Nordic innocence, the, the image that has been portrayed by Norway for the past generations, the, the romanticism of what Norway is from uh, descendants of the Nordic region who traveled out and look back to like, oh, Scandinavia. I think that that Norway that people fantasize about does not exist anymore in that sense. I think Norway has become a, a multicultural hub. It's become uh, a place that it's, it's in the middle of the world. Uh, it's not secluded, it's not segregated in the way that people have assumed that it was. And Norwegian does not look like uh, people assume Norwegians look like anymore. I. I have traveled a lot abroad and I have spent a lot of time defending my Norwegian-ness. When people ask me where I'm from and I say Norway, it, it's never just, oh, okay. Uh, it's the beginning of a big debate. And I think that debate is still happening in Norway in many ways, like where are you really from? The, the, um, the, the capital of being able to define what gets to be Norwegian, what gets to be Nordic, and what gets not to be uh, has been an ongoing discussion in the Nordic region for a long time. But I do think that there's so much change happening right now within the Nordic region, the redefinition of what it means to be Nordic and who gets to be Nordic and who gets to define it for someone else, that th those debates are exploding in the art sector, in the political sector, in the public sector. And I think that is so important, so exhausting, and so um, defining for what it's going to mean to be from the Nordic region in the future, and who would want to be from the Nordic region and define themselves as Nordic, and to be allowed to do so freely. I think that's rapidly changing now. And I think that's important to understand if you have an interest in understanding what it means to be Nordic or what a Nordic value is, because it's com continuously under discussion, which is the most important thing we can do to re-examine ourselves. And she touched on um, the support for our arts and culture, and as mm. a performance artist and a brilliant playwright, could you talk a little bit about your work and, and Well, I think that the, the art sector and the, the working conditions for artists in Norway is very much tied to the value of sustainability. Uh, I think that we have very impressively, and this is way before the oil, very impressively built a culture sector around accessibility for all. There are almost no private institutions in Norway. There are almost no private grants for arts funding. Everything is public, everybody contributes, and that means that everybody owns everything. Uh, the National Theater, the, uh, the Royal Ballet, the uh, museums, it's funded by the people for the people, which is also why there is I would not say universal agreement, but very much a um, uh, uh, societal agreement that we pay for art and we pay artists and we invest in artists and uh, we invest for a long time. 
uh, and we invest in generations of artists. So there are some of the most um, generous grants and stipends and working conditions for artists globally, which I think was became very clear during the pandemic uh, when everybody else were shutting down. Uh, Norwegian artists got extra funding to be able to work from home and to create and to comment on the changes in our society. And, um, and I think that the biggest discussion in the art sector right now, or the public sector, you know, with also liberalism and uh, uh, a, light, a lot of like right-wing rhetoric about art that we need and art we can use and art that is useless. Uh, the notion that some art has to be, uh, that it has to be comfortable that if it's art created by the Norwegian government, funded by the Norwegian government, then it should be there to entertain us or it should be there not to criticize the Norwegian government. But I think the fact that the Norwegian government, the Scan all the Scandinavian and Nordic governments are funding their own political criticism is very important to note and very important to be aware of as a core democratic value in the Nordics, that you should not, not that you should not, but we are, to be able to have a healthy public discourse, to be able to have a public real disagreement, uh, we have to have accessibility to criticism. We need to fund our own critics of our own society if we're, if we're going to be able to progress. And one of those main, those pillars of criticism is media, journalism, and the art sector. And we take that very seriously. And I am very grateful that we do. Uh, because I think that the second you leave criticism to the private sector, then you have to figure out what is monetary in criticism and what is not. And criticism cannot be left to capitalism. It really can't. It has to be social. It has to be uh, public. It has to be ours. And I think that's one of the core. I don't know, I've never said value so many times in my life, I think. But I think it's, it's one of the, the core, the pillars of the Nordic region is that we will fund our own critics to make sure that we are always criticized, always scrutinized, always striving to do better.